Good day. Welcome to our third session for the SPL Refresher Course Program. Let's start with Cybercrime Prevention Act of 2012, governed by RA 10175. So what are the punishable acts under the law? It is actually divided into three, mainly three punishable acts as follows, offenses against the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of computer data and systems. The next part would be the computer-related offenses and then content-related offenses. What does offenses against the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of computer data and systems includes? You have their illegal access. So you have there the definition on what constitutes illegal access. And then you also have their illegal interception. Basically, there would be illegal access and interception if you have there any person who access in whole or in part of your computer system without right. Or it may also include Interception made by technical means without right of any of your computer system carrying such computer data. Now, if you will notice as we go through the law, basically there are limited or no jurisprudence at all considering that there are no cases yet that reach to the Supreme Court as far as the law is concerned. It would also include data interference. In data interference, there is that intentional or reckless alteration, damaging, deletion, or deterioration of computer data, electronic document, or electronic data message without right that makes it illegal or unlawful. In the system interference, it may even include introduction or transmission of viruses to the system itself. So in layman's term, we even call it as hacking. There is also such thing as misuse of devices. So in misuse of devices, it may include production, sale, procurement, importation, distribution, or other Twice making available without right a device, including a program, computer program. It may also include a computer password or access code or similar data in whole or in part of a computer system, such as possession of an item referred to in paragraph 5i, AA, or BB above with intent to use said devices for purpose of committing any of the offenses under this section without right. And then you have their cyber squatting. It is the acquisition of a domain name over the internet in bad faith to profit, mislead, destroy reputation, and deprive others from registering the same if such domain name is similar, identical, or confusingly similar, identical or in any way similar with the name of a person other than the registrant, acquired without right or with intellectual property interest in it. In other words, you acquire a domain name that is registered to someone else already. In terms of computer-related offenses, it includes computer-related forgery as well as computer-related uh, uh, computer forgery and computer-related fraud. So I have double slide on the this one, double. So forgery, computer-related fraud, and forgery. It is the... It includes alteration or deletion of any computer data 
without right that may result in an authentic data with the intent that it be considered or acted upon for legal purposes as if it were authentic. It may also include knowingly using computer data, which is the product of computer-related forgery. As to computer-related fraud, it is the unauthorized input or unauthorized alteration or unauthorized deletion of computer data or program or interference in the functioning of a computer system belonging to another. Take note that if no damage has yet been caused, well, the penalty shall be one degree lower. There is also such thing as computer-related identity theft. So, per experience, we have cases like this, but it's still ongoing trial. But the downside of it is that if your identity is being taken by another one and he uses it to defraud the public, if a complaint is filed against her, basically your name would appear therein first. Like, let's say, Hyacinth T. Hadraki, if someone um, took my identity, a.k.a. The, the, the name of the culprit. But, your name still appears there as an accused. So that is the downside here of computer-related identity theft because we have to allege the identity being taken by the perpetrator. It is the intentional acquisition, use, misuse, transfer, possession, alteration, or deletion of identifying information belonging to another, whether natural or juridical, without right. So, intentional acquisition. As to content-related offenses, so deals with the content. It includes cyber sex, cyber pornography. So, in this first two, it is the willful engagement, maintenance, control, or operation directly or indirectly of any lascivious exhibition of sexual organs or sexual activity with the aid of the computer. In the child pornography, if you notice, it is very similar to that of RA9775. Because if you recall, in Anti-Child Pornography Act, you have there the making of this pornographic material with the use one of it is computer. So basically, if you will be charged for making a pornographic material, it could be that you will be charged under both. Unsolicited commercial communications. So this is the transmission of commercial electronic communication with the use of computer system, which seeks to advertise offer, sell products and services are actually prohibited unless there is prior affirmative consent from the recipient or the primary intent of the communication is for services and or administrative announcement from the sender to its existing user, subscriber, or customers. Otherwise, that shall constitute unsolicited commercial communication, which is covered under the law. And then you have their libel, which is another common uh, punishable act under the law. And then it says here that we have to refer to the elements of libel as provided under Article 355 of the Revised Penal Code. It shall become cybercrime if the defamation was committed through a computer system or any other similar means which may be devised in the future. So what are the elements of cyber libel? So you have there a case that reached the Supreme Court already. So the following are elements of cyber libel. There must be an imputation of a crime 
or a vice or defect, real or imaginary, or any act, omission, condition, status, or circumstance. The imputation must be made publicly, and it was malicious. Basically, the same as that of the revised penal code. And the next, you have their imputation of, of the same to a natural or juridical person, even one who is dead. And the imputation must tend to cause dishonor, discredit, or contempt of the person defamed. In addition to the elements provided under the revised penal code, you have there the additional element that the imputation was done through the use of a computer system or other similar means which may be devised in the future. Aside from those provided under Section 4, you have their Section 5, which provides that the following shall also constitute an offense under the Cybercrime Act. Aiding or abetting in the commission of cybercrime and then attempt in the commission of cybercrime. And take note of par uh, Section 6. It provides that all crimes defined and penalized by the RPC, even with special laws, if committed through with the use of information and communication technologies, ICT, they shall be charged under those law. You can just say in relation to Section 6 of the Cybercrime Act, so that the penalty to be imposed against the accused would be a degree higher than that provided by the RPC and the special laws, as the case may be. Liability under other laws, so a prosecution under this act shall be without prejudice to any liability for violation of the provisions of the revised penal code as amended or special law. So that is provided under section 7. You can be charged under both laws. Okay, let's had this case. One day, M posts on her internet account the statement that a certain married public official has an illicit affair with a movie star. Who posted it? M. L, one of M's friends who sees this post, comments online, yes, this is so true. They are so immoral. M's original post is then multiplied by her friends and the latter's friends and down to the line to friends of friends almost ad infinitum. N, who is a stranger to both M and L, came across this blog, finds it interesting, and so shares the link to this apparently defamatory blog to her Twitter account. N's followers then retweeted the link to that blog site. P, a Twitter user, stumbles upon a random person's retweet of N's original tweet and posts this on her Facebook account. Immediately, P's Facebook friends start liking and making comments on the assailed posting. A lot of them even press the share button resulting in the further spread of the original posting into tens, hundreds, thousands, and greater postings. Are online postings such as liking an openly defamatory statement, commenting on it, or sharing it with others, to be regarded as aiding or abating? And in the complex world of cyberspace, expression of thoughts when will one be liable for aiding or abating cyber crimes? So how did the court resolve the matter? The court answered in the negative. Online posting such as liking an openly defamatory statement, commenting on it, or sharing it with others is not to be regarded 
as aiding or abating. There are two primary reasons why the Supreme Court ruled that this class of interaction in social media will not give rise to liability for cyber libel. First, there is no law punishing such act and in absence of legislation expressly prohibiting such activity, there could be no crime. Second, the laws on libel under the revised penal code from which the Cyber Prevention Act of 2012 refers to punishes only the author of the post, the editor in cases of magazines, newspapers, books, or serialized publications. Clearly, the person liking, sharing, or retweeting is not the author of the original post being shared, liked, or retweeted. Lastly, they do not share the same criminal intent as that of the author of the defamatory post that they shared, like, commented, or retweeted. Thus, online posting such as liking an openly defamatory statement, commenting on it, or sharing it with others is not to be regarded as aiding or abating. So that is the Disney case. Now, I had here, for your reference only, the rule on cybercrime warrants. So I have there the administrative matter for your reference, just in case you want to dig deeper on the rules about cybercrime warrants. So basically, we have warrant to disclose computer data, warrant to intercept computer data, warrant to search, seize, and examine computer data. So this would um, widen, broaden your interest on cybercrime. So that is only for your reference. So those are the salient features of the law. So we'll proceed with anti kidnapping Act of 2016. So what is carnapping as a crime? Carnapping is the taking with intent to gain of a motor vehicle belonging to another without the latter's consent by means of violence against or intimidation of persons or by using force upon things. So when will be when will one be liable for carnapping? So if the uh, the following elements are present to it: taking of a motor vehicle belonging to another. The taking is without the consent of the owner or by means of violence against or intimidation of persons or by using force upon things. And the taking is done with intent to gain. What is a motor vehicle? Take note that a motor vehicle that is subject under the anti kidnapping law refers to a vehicle propelled by any power other than muscular power using the public highway. So these are the motor vehicle referred to in the anti carnapping law. What motor vehicles cannot be subject of carnapping? In other words, not covered under the anti carnapping law. So just in case there would be taking of these vehicles, then do not charge the accused under the anti carnapping it could be uh, theft, robbery, as the case may be, depending on the circumstances. The following are not embraced in the definition of a motor vehicle under the law and thus cannot be the subject of carnapping to it. Road rollers, trolley cars, Street sweepers, sprinklers, lawn mowers, bulldozers, graders, forklifts, amphibian trucks, and cranes, if not used on public highway. To be safe, if these are not used in the public highway at the time of taking. Okay? At the time of taking. And then you have there vehicles which run only on rails or trucks, rail trucks, and tractors, trailers, and traction engines of all kinds used exclusively for agricultural purposes. 
So they are not covered under the anti-carnapping law. In the amendment, there is such thing as identity transfer. It is one of the um, punishable act under the, the law. What is identity transfer? Identity transfer refers to the act of transferring the engine number, chassis number, body tag number, plate number, and any other identifying marks of a motor vehicle declared as total wreck or is beyond economic repair by concerned car insurance companies and or law enforcement agencies after its involvement in a vehicular accident or other incident and registers the same into another factory-made body or vehicle unit of the same classification, type, make, or model. So please be careful. If you buy a second-hand vehicle, make sure that the make there, the chassis number, the engine number there coincides with that of the CR shown to you. Because you might be a victim of this. When is car napping non-bailable? Meaning to say the recommendation would be no bail. So when the car napping is committed by criminal groups, gangs, or syndicate, by means of violence or intimidation of any person or persons or force upon things. And when the owner, driver, passenger, or occupant of the carnap vehicle is killed or raped in the course of the carnapping, shall be denied bail when the evidence of guilt is strong. What is tampering? Is it legal? Defacing or tampering with a serial number refers to the altering, changing, erasing, replacing, or scratching of the original factory inscribed serial number on the motor vehicle engine, engine block, or chassis of any motor vehicle. It's not legal, just like identity transfer. It shall be unlawful for any person to deface or otherwise tamper with the original or registered serial number of motor vehicle engines, engine blocks, and chassis. For purposes of the anti carnapping law, when is the taking of the motor vehicle deemed complete? In a decided case, case, the Supreme Court ruled that the taking of the motor vehicle is deemed complete from the moment the offender gains possession of the thing, even if he has no opportunity to dispose of the same, just like theft. Okay, opportunity to dispose, general rule. Not required. So let's apply. Around 6 in the morning, Rosemary Quintos had just arrived at her employer's house after bringing the latter's child to school when she heard someone shouting. When she turned her back, she saw a man and a woman in front of Brahma Kumaris Meditation Center. She did, she did not personally know the woman, but she usually parks her red car there. The man was initially facing sideward, but he faced her at one point while struggling to get the woman's bag. When the woman finally broke free, the man shot her on the chest. He approached the woman and shot her again. Thereafter, he boarded the red car park in front of Brahma Kumaris. She reported what she saw to Kagawa Julius Duenas. The victim was later identified to be Marie Teresita Tiano. Medical legal officer Dr. Ravil Baluyot autopsied her body and found she had died due to a gunshot wound on the chest. She was the owner of the Hyundai Ascent 2011 model with conduction sticker number MJ3541, the red car driven away by appellant. Appellant was charged with car napping with homicide. Question, is the charge proper? So in People versus Mendoza, the court ruled that the charge was proper. It is a complex crime of car napping with homicide. 
all the elements of carnapping are present. And further, it was proved that the special complex crime of carnapping with homicide, carnapping was the original criminal design of the culprit and the killing was perpetrated in the course of the commission of the carnapping or on the occasion thereof. Hence, he was properly charged with carnapping with homicide. Another case. A, B are workmates in a farm, while X was their former co-worker. One Friday, B saw X visiting A, who lives in a nipa hut within the farm. The next day, B went to check on A as he wasn't seen A the entire day, but when he went to the nipa, he did not find A. He also noticed that A's motorcycle was missing. A's clothes were scattered in the house and the lights were not torn off. Two days later, authorities discovered A's body inside a cement culver in the farm. The day after, neighbors of X noticed that he had a new Yamaha motorcycle. X first claimed ownership of the motorcycle by showing a falsified deed of absolute sale in his favor. But when he testified in court, he claimed that A voluntarily lent him the motorcycle. What crime did X commit? So in the case of People versus Bilvestre, the court ruled that X is guilty of carnapping and should be sentenced to reclusion perpetua. Carnapping is the taking with intent to gain of a motor vehicle belonging to another, as in this case, without the latter's consent or by means of violence against or intimidation of persons or by using force upon things. So the penalty shall be reclusion perpetua because the owner of the carnap vehicle was killed. Here, it is evident that X's original intention was to steal from A. From A's house appeared to have been ransacked. If A only planned to kill A, he would have been, there would have been no reason for him to take the motorcycle, let alone after a deed of absolute sale to claim ownership. So that ends anti-carnapping. Let's proceed with Anti-Drunk and Drug Driving Act of 2013. But if you would be asking if RA4136 is still a good law, my answer would be yes. RA4136 is still a good law. Good, good law. And in fact, you can be charged under 4136 and also 10586 and even under Article 365 of the Revised Penal Code for Reckless Imprudence. So what are the punishable acts under the anti-drunk and drug driving? Of course, you have their driving under the influence of alcohol. It refers to the act of operating a motor vehicle while the driver's blood alcohol concentration level has, after being subjected to a brief analyzer test, reached the level of intoxication as established jointly by the DOH, Napolcom, and DOTC. In other words, it is not just mere uh, having taken alcohol, but to be made criminally liable under the law, the intoxication level must reach to that point um, established by the DOH, Napolcom, and DOTC. What is a breath analyzer? It is the equipment which can determine the blood alcohol concentration level of a person through testing of his breath. Another punishable act is the driving under the influence of dangerous drugs and other similar substances. You can only be made liable under the law. After a confirmatory test is being done to you after the screening test. So, having a positive result of a screening test would not be sufficient to make you liable under the law. A confirmatory, confirmat, confirmatory test has to be done to confirm the positive use 
of any dangerous drug from the screening test. Take note that th this particular law expressly provides that the prosecution of any violation of this act shall be without prejudice to criminal prosecution for violation of under the RPC, RA 9165, and other special laws and existing local ordinances whenever applicable. Swindling by syndicate governed by PD 1689. How is syndicated staffa committed? Now, basically, this applies or the law applies to any person or persons who commit staffa and other forms of swindling as defined in Article 315 and 316 of the RPC. In fact, he shall be punished by life imprisonment to death if committed by a syndicate. So when shall it be committed by a syndicate? If con it consists of five or more persons formed with the intention of carrying out the unlawful or illegal act transaction enterprise scheme, so committed by at least five. And the defraudation results in the misappropriation of money contributed by stockholders, members of rural banks, cooperative, samahang nayon, or farmer association or of funds solicited by corporation or association from the general public. Okay, so it is not just an ordinary staffa. So take note of the qualification that makes it swindling by syndicate. So what are the elements of syndicated staffa? Staffa or other forms of swindling as defined in Article 135, 136 of the RPC is committed. The staffa or swindling is committed by a syndicate. So for purposes of this law, at least five. The defraudation results in the misappropriation of money contributed by stockholders or members of the rural banks, cooperatives, samahang nayon, or farmers association, or of funds solicited by corporations, associations from the general public. So eh, the Supreme Court has come up with the guidelines on what considered as a syndicate. So the following standards is being uh, established by the Supreme Court. It is referring to a group of purported swindlers may be considered a syndicate under PD 1869. At least five in number, they have formed or managed a rural bank, cooperative, Samahang Nayon, Farmers Association, or any other corporation or association that solicits funds from the general public. And they form or manage such association with the intention of carrying out an unlawful or illegal act or transaction. Take note that under this law, life imprisonment to death shall be imposed regardless of the value of the damage or prejudice caused to the general public. So the law shall apply to other corporation or association of operating on funds from the general public. Meaning to say, it may involve a commercial bank. The money misappropriated is not solicited from the general public. Since the same was not solicited from a general public, the law does not apply. The crime is only simple staffa, how versus people. In Galvez, it says here that regardless of the number of the accused, syndicated staffa is not committed when the offenders are not owners or employees who use the association soliciting funds from the general public, such as stockholders, to perpetrate the crime. So take note of the qualification when shall be syndicated staff uh, is committed. So as an application, you have there the case of People versus Romeo. X-Corporation 
owned by the accused was engaged in soliciting funds and investments from the public. The corporation guaranteed an 800% return on investment within 15 or 21 days. What this came, what is this scheme and what should be the charge? So this is a Ponzi scheme and the accused should be charged for syndicated staff. Huh? Such kind of pyramiding. So that ends swindling by a syndicate or syndicated staff. Huh? Illegal recruitment under RA 122. So the particular provision under the Migrant Workers and Overseas Filipino, Filipinos Act of 1995 who are the usual victims of illegal recruiter. So for purposes of this law, the overseas Filipino worker, OFW, is used interchangeably with migrant worker. So they are person who is to be engaged, is engaged, or has been engaged in a remunerated activity in a state of which he or she is not a citizen or on board a vessel navigating the foreign seas other than a government ship used for military or non-commercial purposes or on an installation located offshore or on high seas. So they are our OFW or migrant worker. How is illegal recruitment committed under this act? Illegal recruitment shall mean an act of canvassing, enlisting, contracting, transporting, utilizing, hiring, or procuring workers and includes referring, contract services, promising, or advertising of employment abroad, whether for profit or not, when undertaken by a non-licensee or non-holder of authority. That makes it illegal recruitment under the law. Okay, so for as long as this non-licensee or non-holder offers or promises for a fee employment abroad to two or more persons shall be deemed to so engage in illegal recruitment. It shall likewise include the following acts. Whether committed by any person, whether non-licensee, non-holder, licensee, or holder of authority, it is still considered illegal recruitment to charge or accept directly or indirectly any amount greater than that specified in the schedule of allowable fees prescribed by the Secretary of Labor and Employment, or to make a worker pay or acknowledge any amount greater than that actually received by him as a loan or advance. Furnish or publish any false notice or information or document in relation to the recruitment or employment of the OFW or the migrant worker. Further, to give any false notice, testimony or information or document or commit any act of misrepresentation for purposes of securing a license or authority under the labor code, Include or attempt to induce a worker already employed to quit his employment in order to offer him another unless the transfer is designed to liberate a worker from oppressive terms and conditions of employment. Okay, so that is the uh, an exception that the, the, the licensee holder or not holder of authority cannot be made liable for illegal recruitment if the same is designed to liberate a worker from oppressive terms and conditions. To substitute or alter to the prejudice of the worker employment contracts approved and verified by the Department of Labor and Employment from the time of actual signing. It also includes an officer or agent of a recruitment or placement agency to become an officer or member of the board of any corporation engaged in travel agency to withhold or deny travel documents from applicant workers. So usually, they would keep the visa of the OFW or the migrant worker. Failure to actually deploy a contractual worker without valid reason. 
failure to reimburse expenses incurred by the worker in connection with his documentation and processing for purposes of deployment, and then to allow a non-Filipino citizen to head or manage a licensed recruitment or money agency. They are all punishable under the, the law. When is recruitment deemed committed by a syndicate? When shall illegal recruitment deemed committed in large scale? So illegal recruitment is deemed committed by a syndicate if carried out by a group of three or more persons conspiring and confederating with one another. It will be on a large scale if the same was committed against three or more persons individually or as a group. R810591 or the Comprehensive Firearms and Ammunitions Regulation Act. So what are the salient features of the law? You have there the definition of a firearm. Refers to a handheld or portable weapon, whether small arm or light weapon, that expels or is designed to expel a bullet, shot, slug, missile, or any projectile which is discharged by means of expansive force of gases from burning and powder or from other form of combustion or any similar instrument or implement for purposes of this act, the barrel, frame, or receiver is considered a firearm. How about a forfeited firearm? A firearm is deemed forfeited if the same has been a subject to forfeiture by reason of court order. You also have there if the firearm is considered as abandoned, surrendered, confiscated, or revoked forfeited firearm. What is an imitation firearm? For purposes of this law, imitation firearm refers to a replica of a firearm or other device that is so substantially similar in color, color, coloration and overall appearance to an existing firearm as to lead a reasonable person to believe that such imitation firearm is a real firearm. How about a loose firearm? A loose firearm refers to an unregistered firearm. It would also mean obliterated or altered firearm which has been lost or stolen. It would also include illegally manufactured firearm, registered firearms in the possession of individuals other than the licensee, and those with revoked licenses, they are all referred to as loose firearm. What is a permit to carry firearms outside of residence? So known as the PTC, permit to carry. <clears throat> permit to carry firearms outside of residence refers to a written authority issued to a licensed citizen by the chief of the PNP, which entities such person, which entitles such person to carry his or registered or lawfully issued firearm outside of the residence for the duration and purpose specified in the authority. Now, you have to remember that when a person um, applied for a, a, an authority to possess firearm, that is one permit only, your registration or your authority to possess firearm. Aside from that, you also need to secure a permit or you, you need to register your firearm itself. The firearm needs to be registered. You, the holder, has to be registered. Now, PTC is another permit that you need to secure so that you will be allowed to carry your firearm outside of your residence. Now, what if you have many residences? Now, the residence that shall be considered for purposes of the application of the law is the residence of yours as reflected in your registration, in your license uh, given by the firearms, the FEO. If your residence is put there, let's say, 
Sambag Street, Cebu City. And you also have there another residence or house in Mabolo or one in Banawa. If you want to bring your firearm from Sambag to Mabolo or to Banawa, you need to secure a PTC. Because your Mabolo residence, your, uh, what's the other one? Banawa residence is not the residence to referred to under the law for purposes of the application of the law. That firearm, that authority to possess firearm is valid as far as your possession, your authority in your Sambag residence is concerned. Other than your residence as reflected in your license, you need a PTC. Otherwise, you will be charged for carrying a licensed firearm outside your residence without PTC. Who can be, uh, what are considered small arms? Small arms, it is where generally issued to individuals refers to firearms intended to be or primarily designed for individual use or that which is generally considered to mean a weapon intended to be fired from the hand or shoulder which are not capable of fully automatic bursts of discharge such as handgun and your handgun would either be pistol or a revolver. Then you have there the rifle and shotgun. Who can own or possess firearm? So these are the minimum requirements of one who will be authorized to own and possess a firearm. The applicant must be a Filipino citizen at least 21 years old, uh, gainfully employed, and has filed an ITR of the preceding year as proof of income, profession or business or occupation, so that ITR is very uh, significant. And in addition to that basic qualification, you must submit um, a certification issued by the appropriate authorities attesting that you have not, has not been convicted of a crime involving moral torpitude. The applicant has passed the psychiatric uh, psychiat psychiatric psychiatric tests administered by the PNP accredited psychologist or psychiatrist and the applicant has passed the drug test conducted by the authorized drug testing laboratory or clinic. Further, he must have passed a gun safety seminar. He must have filed in writing the application to possess the registered firearm. The applicant must present a police clearance from the city or municipality. The applicant has not been convicted or is currently an accused in a pending case before any court that is punishable with a penalty. The, the applicant has not been convicted or is currently an accused in a pending criminal case before any court of law for a crime that is punishable with a penalty of more than two years. So if you none of this would actually a ground for denial of your registration or authority to own and possess a firearm. So who are allowed to carry firearms outside of residence? A permit to carry firearms outside of the residence shall be issued by the chief of the PNP or his all duly authorized representative to any qualified person whose life is under actual threat or imminent danger due to the nature of his or her profession, occupation, or business. So meaning to say the applicant has the burden of proving that his life is under actual threat by submitting a threat assessment certification. And who are they? They may be members of the Philippine Bar, 
the CPAs, so these are actually the profession professions to which they look considered to be in imminent danger due to the nature of their profession, occupation, or business. Media practitioners, cashiers, bank tellers, priests, ministers, rabbis, imams, physicians and nurses, engineers, and businessmen who by the nature of their business or undertaking are exposed to high risk of being targets of criminal elements. In section 19, it actually tells you when to renew your license. So as far as the license to possess firearms is concerned, it has to be renewed every two years. The registration of your firearms, it shall be renewed every four years. Now, use of loose firearm in the commission of the crime is considered to be aggravating. Okay, as a rule, the use of a loose firearm when inherent in the commission of a crime punishable by the RPC or other special laws shall be considered as aggravating circumstances. Okay, aggravating only ha, if inherent. Provided that if the crime committed with the use of a loose firearm is penalized by the law with a maximum penalty, which is lower than that prescribed in the preceding section for illegal possession of firearm, the penalty for illegal possession of firearm shall be imposed in lieu of the penalty of the crime charge. So to illustrate, if you use a loose firearm in threatening another, the crime would be to be charged against you would be grave threat or other light threat, as the case may be. And take note that the penalty of those uh, felonies are lower than possession, the penalty of possession of the loose firearm. So under the law, it says here that even if your charge is grave threat or other light threat, as the case may be, because you use a loose firearm, in the commission of the crime, the penalty for illegal possession of firearms shall be imposed upon you in lieu of the penalty of the crime charge. And that is clear. Now, how about if the penalty of the crime charge is equal or higher than the possession of loose, of fire, loose firearm? Section 29 further provides... That if the crime committed with the use of a loose firearm, example, homicide or murder, is penalized with a maximum penalty which is equal to that imposed upon the preceding section or illegal possession of firearms, the penalty of prison mayor in its minimum period shall be imposed in addition to the penalty of the crime punishable under the revised penal code or other special laws of which he is found guilty. Take note how the prison mayor minimum shall be a penalty imposed upon you in addition to the penalty of the crime to which you are charged and found guilty. If the violation of this act is in furtherance of or incident to or in connection with a crime of rebellion or insurrection or attempted coup, such violation shall be absorbed as an element of the crime. Okay, element. If the crime is committed by a person without using the loose firearm, the violation of this act shall be considered as a distinct and separate offense. What does this paragraph mean? For example, uh, you were caught violating RA 9165. It could be that you... A bypass was done against you. So after the consummation of the sale, you were arrested. And as incident to your lawful arrest, the police officers found in plain view a firearm against you that shall constitute a distinct and separate offense from RA 9165. Imitation firearm in section 35. If you use an imitation firearm in the commission of the crime for purposes of applying the law, that is considered to be a real firearm, even if your firearm use is just an imitation. Considered a real firearm if the same was used in the commission of the crime. 
Planting of evidence is actually punishable under Article 38. Okay? That is the uh, willful and malicious insert, place, or attach directly or indirectly through any overt or covert act, any firearm or ammunition, or parts thereof in the person, house, or effects of a person or its immediate vicinity. Planting of evidence. Will it be unlawful to transfer possession of a firearm to a person other than the licensee? Now, Section 41 provides that it shall be unlawful to transfer possession of any firearm to any person who has not yet obtained or secured the necessary license or permit thereof. In other words, if you don't want your firearm anymore, follow the procedure. Do not do it in your own way by just selling it to another person who is not even a licensed firearm holder. Because if that firearm will be used uh, in the commission of the crime, and it is under your name, you are the registered owner of the particular firearm, then you might get implicated. So you have there section 41. Now, uh, curiously to the illegal possession of firearms, you have their possession of explosives under PD 9516. So what are considered to be explosives? The penalty of reclusion perpetua shall be imposed upon any person who shall willfully and unlawfully manufacture, assemble, deal in, acquire, dispose, import, or possess any explosive or incendiary device with knowledge of its existence and its explosive or incendiary character where the explosive or incendiary device is capable of producing destructive effect on contiguous objects or causing injury or death to any person including but not limited to hand grenade, rifle grenade, pillbox bomb, molotov cocktail bomb, fire bomb, and other similar explosive and incendiary devices. Now, take note. Uh, I, I think you have heard of someone who was implicated under RA 9516 and was not able to post bail despite the fact that the hand grenade is very rusty. Because a rusty hand grenade is still a hand grenade punished under PD 9516. Now take note, possession of any explosive or incendiary device. The next paragraph I, I think it's here. The next section. Possession of any part, ingredient, machinery, tool, or instrument of any explosive or incendiary device is still punished under the law. And take note, the penalty is still reclusion perpetua so that no bail shall be recommended. Any part or, or the whole incendiary device, non-bailable. Now, let's go back to the missing portion. Mere possession of any explosive or incendiary device shall be prima facie evidence that the person had knowledge of its existence. However, Temporary, incidental, casual, harmless, or transient possession or control of any of the explosive or incendiary device without knowledge of its existence shall not be a violation of this section. Provided further that temporary, incidental, casual, or transient possession for the sole purpose of surrendering it to the proper authorities shall likewise not be a violation of this section. In other words, this temporary or incidental, casual, harmless possession, this would negate animus possidende. So the prima facie does not apply. So as far as any part of the incendiary device, same thing. You have there the prima facie evidence, temporary or casual, not a violation, temporary or casual for purposes of delivering it to the proper authority, 
for purposes of detonation, the explosive or incendiary device, not a violation of this act. In other words, animos possidendi is an element of the crime, intent to possess. Now take note that in 3C, it says here that um, when a violation of Section 3, 3A, or 3B of this decree is a necessary means for committing any crimes defined in the RPC or special laws or in furtherance of incident to or connection with by reason or location of any of the crimes defined in the RPC or special laws, uh, the penalty shall be reclusion perpetua and fine of 100 to 1 million shall be imposed. Does double jeopardy applies? The answer is yes. Subject to the provisions of the rules of court on double jeopardy, if the application or hope is more favorable to the accused, the conviction or acquittal of the accused or the dismissal of the case for violation of this decree shall be a bar to another prosecution of the same accused for any offense where the violation of this decree was a necessary means for committing the offense or in furtherance of which incident to which or in connection with which, by reason of which or on occasion of which the violation of this decree was committed and vice versa. In other words, while there is no bar to prosecution, okay, no bar to prosecution, dismissal, acquittal, or conviction of one shall be a bar to another prosecution. Okay, so double jeopardy applies. Revised Forestry Code under PD 705. Now, there are actually many punishable acts under PD 705, but we'll just focus on the sum of it and we'll just browse on it. So, under PD 705, it shall be unlawful for a person who cut, gather, or collect timber or other products without license. Okay, that is given. Without license, that is punished under 705. It is also punishable when you pasture a livestock. You are liable if you do it without authority, under a lease, or permit, graze, or cause to graze livestock in a forest land, grazing land, and alienable and disposable land, which has not yet been disposed of in accordance with the Public Land Act. In other words, just uh, pasture your animals in your own property. okay? Because if it is still a public land and you are not a recipient of any permit or grantee of such a permit, then you may be made liable under PD 705. Illegal occupation of national park system and recreation areas, including vandalism therein, is covered under the law. Unlawful possession of implements and devices used by forest officers. What does this mean? Now, there are uh, implements and devices that are... Whose authority is for those persons who are licensee or grantee of permits? If the offender is a holder thereof of any lease agreement, license agreement, or permit, he will be authorized to possess. But if you don't have such authority from the director or authorized representative. It's not only possession, but you also make, you manufacture any of this that is punished under Section 77. Sale of wood products. This shall be punishable if the person who sell, offer to sell any log, lumber, plywood, or other manufactured wood products 
in the international or domestic market uh, has no authority to do such selling or offering it for sale. Okay? Sale of wood products. Fisheries code. There are also many acts punished under the fisheries code. Now, you might be saying, it will not come out in the bar. Okay, it may not come out in the bar, but at least if it will come out, at least you are, the, the, the law is not alien to you anymore. So just go over this punishable acts under the fisheries code. Fishing without a valid license, authorization, or permit. Fishing without reporting the catch or misreporting the catch. Fishing in a closed area or during a closed season. Fishing of prohibited species. Fishing with the use of prohibited gear or method. You also have there falsifying, concealing, tampering with visual marking. Concealing, tampering, or disposing evidence relating to an investigation of a violation. Assaulting, resisting, intimidating, harassing, seriously interfering with or unduly obstructing the or delaying a fisheries law enforcer, authorized inspector or observer, or any other duly authorized government officer, intentionally tampering with a disabling or disabling the vessel monitoring system, committing multiple violations, which taken together constitute a serious disregard of the code, unauthorized fishing. There shall be an authorized fishing if the person capture or gather fish fry or fingerlings to any of any fishery species without license or permit from the LGU engaging in unauthorized fisheries activities when shall this be if you exploit occupy produce breed or culture fish fry or fingerlings uh, you construct or operate fish corals, fish traps, fish pens, or fish cages, or fish pans without a license, lease, or permit. You also have there. Failure to secure fisher fishing permit prior to engaging in distant water fishing. Unreported fishing. Unregulated fishing. You also have their poaching in Philippine waters. Okay, so it shall be unlawful for any foreign person, corporation, or entity to fish or operate any fishing vessel in Philippine waters without prior permit. Fishing through explosives, noxious or substance or electricity. Use of fine fish nets is another violation. Fishing in overexploited fishery management areas, use of active gear in municipal water, ban on coral exploitation and uh, exportation, ban on moroami, of course, you are familiar with moroami, illegal use of super lights or fishing light attractor that is also illegal. Uh, conversion of mangroves is another punishable act. Fishing during close season, fishing in marine protected areas, fishing or taking rare, threatened or endangered species. So I think you are all familiar with the parrot fish that is actually an endangered species. Mul mul. Okay, so you have their capture of sabalo and other breeders or spawners. So they are prohibited. Exportation of breeders, spawners, eggs, or fries is likewise punishable if you don't have there the permit. Importation or exportation of fish or fishery species. Violation of harvest control rules if you cause aquatic pollution. Gathering and marketing of shellfishes or other aquatic species. Possessing, dealing in, or disposing illegally caught or taken fish. Okay, possession of this um, fish illegally caught is punishable. Now, if you notice, there are lots of acts being punished under the fisheries code. 
what I can think of as the only exception would be on the sustenance, those fishermen who fish for its sustenance. If you notice, these people, unless huh, they, they involve in dynamite fishing, that would be another story. But if they are just fishing for their sustenance, meaning to say they eat the fish to have something to eat for their sustenance, daily sustenance, and they did not use fine fish nets, it's not a violation. But being a sustenance fisherman doesn't mean as well that they can just fish as well in the protected area. So you have just have to comply with all this. Even if you don't have a permit, then you are not covered under the law. The sustenance fishermen. You have their citizen suit. Any of this violation, any person or any citizen may file an appropriate civil, criminal, or administrative action in the proper courts or bodies against any person who violates uh, provision of the fisheries code. It can even sue the government itself or the public officer who grossly neglects the performance of duty in the implementation of the law. But for those public officers who did their best in the performance of duty, who did their best in the implementation of the law to the point that they are also sued because of their performance of duty, you have their slap as a defense. Strategic lawsuit against public participation. It is a defense available to these enforcement, uh, law enforcement officers against any legal action filed against them for purposes of harassing, vexing, or exerting a due pressure on them in the performance of their duty. Okay, so that is a defense available to these public officers. The last word today would be the Coconut Preservation Act under 10593. What are the acts punished under the Coconut Preservation Act? No coconut shall be cut, except in the following cases, and only after a permit has been issued therefore. So these are the circumstances wherein a coconut tree may be cut, plus the permit to cut. When the tree is 60 years old, in case of tall varieties, or at least 40 years old for dwarf varieties. And the three and the tree is no longer economically productive. Next, the tree is severely disease, severely disease infested and beyond rehabilitation, or the tree is severely damaged by typhoon or lightning. And, uh, and next, you have there, when the agricultural land devoted to coconut production shall have been converted in accordance with the law into residential, commercial, or industrial area. So, meaning to say, uh, this is, you have there, Uh, as far as my analysis is concerned, the tree must not must be at least any of the circumstances. It doesn't mean that he has that the tree has to comply with all the requisites. Okay, and then if in case of conversion, so of course you have there the law converting that particular land to which your coconut tree, even if it's your coconut tree, uh, being planted. So prior to its actual cutting. Secure a permit first. When the land devoted to coconut production shall be converted into other agricultural uses or other agriculture-related activities pursuant to a conversion duly applied by the owner and approved by the proper authorities, provided that no conversion shall be allowed by the PCA or the Philippine Coconut Authority until after it shall have been verified and certified that for a period of at least three years, 
majority of the coconut trees have become senescent and economically unproductive and where the coconut farm is not adaptable to sound management practices on account of geographical location, topography, drainage, and other conditions rendering the farm economically unproductive and when the tree would cause hazard to life and property. No other causes other than those above mentioned shall be considered as a valid ground for cutting. Okay, valid ground, you have the valid ground for cutting plus permit to cut. So that is provided under Section 5, unless there is a permit being issued upon due application. Due application because you have to prove the valid grounds to which you shall cut the coconut tree. No permit to cut shall be granted unless the applicant has secured from the barangay captain of the locality where the cutting will be done is certification under oath that he or she has already planted the equivalent number of coconut trees applied for to be cut. Meaning to say, aside from the fact that you will uh, apply for it, uh, secure a permit to cut, you are actually required to plant same number as the number of coconut tree that has to be cut. And such replanting, however, shall not apply if the area converted into in, does not apply to areas converted to industrial, commercial, or residential sites or land transfer into in accordance with law into other agricultural purposes. So that is your only um, excuse not to plant um, another coconut tree. So that ends our third session. And thank you for your time. Good day.